Is there a recording right now? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. So we spoke about keratoconus earlier, especially when we're talking about patients that had astigmatism. And a lot of times, if we see patients, especially kids or people whose astigmatism is increasing every year, um, we start suspecting keratoconus because when you very early, early keratoconus, when you, you look at someone's eye, you can't necessarily tell. Um, and so that's why a lot of the technology we have helps us to detect keratoconus even earlier before there's damage to the front of the eye. So keratoconus, um, if you break up the word, kerato refers to the cornea, the front part of the eye, and conus refers to the shape of the eye becomes more cone-like. So <clears throat> this is kind of exaggerated, but some people in really severe keratoconus develop this really kind of pointy keratoconus eye on the right. Um, it's usually actually a little, the cone is a little decentered, um, a little more inferiorly. It's not usually right in the middle like it is there. Um, but it happens because there's thinning in the cornea and there's different reasons for that, which we'll get into, but it's typically progressive thinning and that thinning is what causes the astigmatism and the shape of the front of their eye to change a lot. Um, and then because they have a more distorted shape of the front of the eye, as you can imagine, that causes light when it comes into the eye to focus in a much more irregular pattern and that's why they have a lot of distorted vision that can't be corrected with normal glasses. So Dr. Dave alluded to, again, that spherical normal eye would have a pattern like this where it's all similar colors. You don't see that bow tie like we saw before showing a steep versus flat um, kind of meridians in the eye. <coughs> Um, so this would be someone with normal astigmatism, so steeper again, we were saying in the vertical meridian. Um, but with keratoconus, um, and kind of to backtrack a little bit, we talked about the vitreous in the eye, and that helps keep the shape of the eye. So you have this clear sack of jelly that's inside the eye, and it provides nutrients, um, also keeps the structures um, like the retina tacked on inside your eye. It gives a little bit of um, pressure, I guess, um, but more so uh, over time, what can happen is the, you know, that pressure, if you have a really thin area of the eye, so if the cornea becomes progressively thin, that pressure can actually cause bulging out in those thin areas. So if you've ever seen like a balloon, maybe if you stretch out a part of a balloon and over time, you'll notice like that thinner part will bulge out more. Um, that's kind of what happens in keratoconus. So you do need to have some amount of pressure in the eye to keep all the structures there. Kind of going back to cataract surgery, if the wound doesn't close, a lot of the, that fluid leaks out and then um, that can cause detachments inside the eye because you need some pressure from like the vitreous and the fluids in the eye to keep the structures, keep the shape of the eye and keep the structures there. So um, keratoconus is then when the fluid forces in the eye start to cause that cone shape in that thin area. So on the bottom left is what a topographical map of keratoconus would look like. So you get that inferior steepening of the eye and it's in kind of a cone shape if you were to look at the actual eye itself. And so um, a topography, um, you've probably seen them before, but it's almost like an elevation map. So, you know, they have topography maps out in the world for mountains and things like that to show steepness. Um, and so this kind of like if you're looking at the cross section of the eye that these give us maps in that way to show us um, the shapes because we can't see that with the blind eye. <clears throat> so keratoconus, again, it causes distorted vision because light then is getting focused in the eye at a lot more irregular different places. And that's oftentimes um, with keratoconus patients that they might say that their vision's worse at night because, as you can imagine, if their pupil gets bigger, they're looking through more of the cone and more of their irregularities than during the daytime. <clears throat> And so they'll, yeah, there are symptoms of, kind, they'll get a lot of doubling of vision. So simulated down on the bottom right, um, they'll notice maybe ghosting, a lot more scattered light with that. 
So that we actually don't know why people get keratoconus. There's a lot of theories, but um, you know, if someone comes in and we diagnose them with keratoconus, there's not necessarily one reason, but there are definitely risk factors. So genetics, some people have keratoconus that just runs in the family. So there is an element that um, there are some genes that can make you more predisposed to developing keratoconus. <clears throat> um, the earlier you develop keratoconus in life, usually the more severe it will be over your lifetime. So um, it's actually better if you have the type, of, there's different types of keratoconus in terms of if you get more of a later stage when you're in your 30s or 40s, it actually usually doesn't progress as much as someone that's younger. <clears throat> um, in kids, especially if we notice a lot of eye rubbing, the reason that's bad is that can actually instigate maybe some thinning of the cornea that could trigger keratoconus to develop in these patients. As well as um, LASIK surgery, so I feel like we're pretty conservative um, as doctors here in recommending LASIK surgery because we see a lot of the complications after surgery as well as keratoconus specialists. So um, some patients, um, not necessarily, so some, some surgical centers maybe may make um, someone's cornea too thin, and if it's too thin, then it can't withstand the pressure in the eye. Um, some patients, it's maybe not even that it's too thin, but they have this predisposition or the genetics, then that kind of instigates them to develop keratoconus as well. <clears throat> Are they told when they have LASIK surgery that it could be like a side effect? Um, I think there's like a list of complications. They don't no. <laughs> but like, I think that's why Trisha, or where Trisha, some of Trisha's came from, and can you like go back to the LASIK people and say, you know, or are you kind of, you kind of I mean, like, yeah, you kind of sign, time? whenever you do any surgery, they tell you the rest and you sign off on it. So, um, for instance, like dry eyes, a possible complication of LASIK. Right. Um, but, yeah, and so as you can imagine, yeah, when they do laser surgery, they literally laser off the thickness of the eye and they make it thinner to correct for your prescription because it has power in it but yeah if you make it too thin then it can't withstand the pressure in the eye so um, that's a huh is there ever been a time during a LASIK pre-op where you have really suggested against it based on what oh said? yeah so when we do a, a pre-op um, when we do a LASIK evaluation in our office we do topography and that can help us detect early keratoconus. Um, they do, there's another even more specialized topography called tomography um, that they'll usually do at the surgical center. And that actually checks the back, almost like the back topography, because the thinning actually starts, you see the thinning in the back before it happens in the front, as you can imagine, because it slowly bulges forward. Um, so that's a test they do. Um, so, so typically, we'll catch a lot of it from doing our topography, but every once in a while, they might catch um, an even earlier sign of keratoconus um, from doing that. So um, if anyone has any early signs, the surgical center is supposed to say, no, you can't have this surgery, because actually, um, we need to do other treatments for you. Um, but it's unfortunate that people go in um, and they pay, usually out of pocket to get LASIK surgery and sometimes develop this other condition afterwards that can't be corrected with LASIK surgery. So symptoms for keratoconus, um, patients will say that, you know, they notice every year their glasses um, prescriptions keep increasing in the astigmatism. Um, they might start noticing that they just, even with the correction, um, their prescription that they can't get as good crisp vision as they're used to. They get blurred, um, distorted vision. They might become more light sensitive again because light is scattering more in their eye. Um, I meant to ask Dr. Dave what he meant by unique personality yeah, for I these patients. Um, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, there's unique, I think there's unique personalities in any sort of condition. So, um, you know, it, I would say that it's, it's sometimes hard to articulate to, it's sometimes hard to articulate to these patients why even if we spit them in specialty lenses, they're gonna still have some of this distortion because even though we can get their vision better, they still have keratoconus. So they will still get some distortion. <clears throat> so this is a very good example of what someone with keratoconus um, might experience, especially at night. Again, um, sometimes we can get them really good day vision, but at night their vision will be pretty distorted Trisha like this. this is exactly mm -hmm. her exact. Yep, so you'll see like double vision, ghosting, all those things. If they weren't corrected, if, you know, even if they tried to do regular glasses correction, they might experience something like this. I get that picture though, that's what I'm <laughs> So that's an out hard 
Yeah, this is if they don't okay. wear specialty lenses. They might still get a little residual with specialty lenses. Um, yeah, and so an high astigmatism can do a little bit of that. Is that why certain patients that have specialty lenses are so adamant they still can't see correctly? And yeah. Just don't get it? And so that's where we have to give the right expectations. Like, yes, we'll get you to see better. And sometimes by helping them see better, they see more of the intricacies of the keratoconus, too. Um, so keratoconus is detected in several ways. Um, we can detect it early on in topography again um, with the color maps you see up there. Um, high astigmatism in a prescription will definitely make me more wary. Um, when you look in the slit lamp, if, if it's pretty far along in terms of keratoconus where you know the patient probably is diagnosed at this point, but sometimes they're not, um, that you can actually see what's called Fleischer's ring. So in our tears, so there's all sorts of minerals and some of the minerals can actually deposit around the base of the cone. And so that's why here we'll actually see kind of like this ring, um, iron ring line around the base of the cone. Um, so we can see that in a high powered microscope in our slit lamps. Um, vertical striae is actually because the cornea is getting thin, um, you actually see these vertical lines and that's like kind of where the bulging and thinning is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and then in very serious, severe keratoconus, your eye naturally tries to start scarring the cornea to, cause a scar essentially, right, thickens up, um, like if you on any tissue, and so your eye is trying to um, protect itself from getting so thin that it ruptures. So that's called high drops that can happen in severe keratoconus, but um, the eye naturally starts to try to scar itself. Um, and then that obviously blocks people's vision because then they're looking through a scar. So that happens in very severe keratoconus. Very early um, keratoconus, um, Dr. Chrissy and Dr. Shen, I know, um, have referred patients to us because on ret when they do retinos retinoscopy with the light, um, the it doesn't have a regular pattern like all the lights are crisscrossing and things like that. And you know they they do topography sometimes as well, um, and the we'll get referred um, from them or from even another doctors that notice those kind of subtle findings um, that we can see in early keratoconus. Um, a really cool new technology that's come out in the last few years, um, and we have it on two of our OCTs, is topography. So topography, um, oh no, not sorry, not topography, uh, pachymetry. That's one that we need to add on here. Um, I think it's on a later slide, but pachymetry actually uh, means checking the the areas of thickness of the cornea. And so in this area where the red is, I would expect the cornea to also be thin in that area. So um, we're starting to find more ways to catch early keratoconus. So if we see areas of thinning in that area, even before we see kind of that surface um, change, we can detect it possibly earlier too. And then on OCT um, as well, when you do the cross sections of the eye, like when we're doing like scleral lens pictures and things like that, you can sometimes see the thinning on the cornea if you get the right cross section. So there's a lot of different options for treating keratoconus. None of them are curative. Um, it, corneal cross-linking is a kind of preventative treatment in terms of preventing progression. So it doesn't, again, cure keratoconus, but corneal cross-linking has been done probably for decades across the world, mainly Europe and Canada, but only recently um, in the last year got approved in the United States. And what that involves is literally they put on riboflavin, which is a chemical on the eye, and then they use a UV light. And essentially it helps harden the cornea to hopefully prevent it from thinning over time. So corneal cross-linking is something that we recommend as early as possible for our keratoconus patients to prevent it from thinning because if it thins too much and if they get scarring or if their cornea ruptures, um, they might need to get a more invasive surgery like a transplant surgery, but we'll get there. Um, custom soft, and corneal cross-linking is something they can do, do multiple times. Since it's so new, we don't know how long it will kind of keep the eye hard um, and the cornea hard, so it's potentially patients can get it done multiple times. Probably not covered by insurance then? Not yet, but I think it will be. I'm hoping it will be in the future, but right as of now, it's not covered by insurance. 
Uh, some patients in early keratoconus, we can just do customized soft contact lenses. Maybe their eye isn't bulging out as much and as irregular that um, we can dial in that high um, astigmatism correction and custom lenses for them. Um, the shape of the lens is probably a little bit more curved than um, regular contacts that we have, but um, we can still sometimes use soft lenses. Uh, gas permeable contact lenses, so those small rigid lenses that Dr. Dave was talking about a lot of times um, are successful for keratoconus patients, but as you can imagine, if their eye keeps getting pointier and pointier, um, it's going to be really hard to keep a lens on, um, something like that, and so eventually those patients might start saying like, oh, my lens keeps falling out, and so um, there's other options for them as well. Um, a piggyback contact lens refers to doing a soft lens underneath the hard lens, and that, um, again, um, might make the lens more comfortable or it might give them more correction. There's different reasons for doing piggybacking. Um, hybrid contact lenses, we don't do that often. Um, there's really only one company that does it now, or it's the most common one is a company called Synergize. And it is a center hard lens, but then the outside of the lens has a soft contact lens. So it's supposed to be like, in theory, the best of both worlds in terms of really great optics. Um, hard lenses provide really great um, vision. Um, and then comfort, the comfort of a soft lens on the outside, but they're not always as comfortable, comfortable. as, uh, <laughs> as <laughs> in theory they're supposed to be. But we still fit them because some people still really like them. Um, scleral lenses is a picture on here of an example of a scleral lens. And the reason scleral lenses work so well for patients and the reason we fit most of our keratoconus patients in scleral lenses is because it takes the advantage of using this big lens and filling the lens with fluid to essentially kind of neutralize all those irregularities on their cornea. And so that's how they're able to get better vision because it almost creates kind of a smoother surface that's focusing the eye. Um, they obviously still have the keratoconus and irregularities of that, so they'll typically get better vision. Um, and the lens stays on their eye better than a lot of the other lenses. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, so scleral lenses are something that a lot of patients are the most successful in because they're comfortable as well. Intax is a surgery where they actually put some implanted kind of half rings into the eye. Um, so they would put them under here over the cornea to literally um, almost like stretch the cornea um, this kind of this way in order to make the cone like flatten out a little bit and the theory was supposed to be that you could better fit more contacts over it but it still makes an irregular area so um, it's still done but it's not um, it doesn't again help slow the condition down or anything like that well it's not done as often um, topography guided conductive keratoplasty is also something that's rarely done but literally they make laser marks on the eye thinking that it'll harden certain areas to prevent again progression um, we have a couple patients that have had it done but it's very rare um, i don't know anyone in washington that does it uh, restasis is something that we treat some of our keratoconus patients with um, they did some research and found that patients that had keratoconus had higher levels of inflammation in the eye and then there was another study that showed that patients that were on restasis that actually helped stabilize their condition a little bit. So um, a lot of our patients, were on, they're on restasis for that reason. Um, but there's the added benefit. Restasis is primarily a dry eye medication. A lot of the keratoconus patients um, have dry eye as well. So it has kind of a double effect for them. Um, and again, if someone's an eye rubber, uh, we'll put them on allergy eye drops to help reduce eye rubbing because that kind of progresses the condition as well. And worst case scenario, if the cornea gets too thin, um, they'll need a corneal transplant. So 10% of patients with keratoconus will end up needing a corneal transplant. And even when they get a transplant, oftentimes they have to get multiple transplants because they can manage with any sort of organ transplant that um, it can reject. And so corneal transplants can reject as well. So um, less than 10% are getting that. And I think that number is decreasing because we now have more preventative things like corneal cross-linking that's preventing people from getting to that point, hopefully, of needing a transplant. We have a few of those patients. Yeah. Like Derek, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of patients that have had transplants. 
Um, and then if they've had a transplant, you can imagine that makes their eye even more irregular. So um, scleral lenses are almost always the best option because again, that fluid reservoir will fill in. Um, a lot of times they'll still have the sutures and things like that. So that fluid reservoir helps kind of create a smoother surface on their eye to correct light. What's the acuity of a patient like that? I mean, just looking at the cornea to see um, it's usually like 2,400. I mean, if they aren't wearing correction, yeah. With sclerals, though. Oh, with scleral. I mean, with scleral lenses, we can get a lot of our keratoconus patients to 2020. Now, at night, there's, I still warn patients at night, you're still probably going to get some scattered light halos because, again, you're, they're look, they still right. can see, they still have keratoconus. So, but we can usually get them to 2020. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is very, one of the most rewarding things I do, I do is fitting patients in sclerals for the first time that haven't seen well their whole lives, um, and then they come to us and then they see 2020 for the first time in decades, so that's and why been don't practices do this? Um, You know, it's just an extra skill that, I mean, they, it is taught in all schools, but it is something, a skill you have to keep up with. Um, and it's something that you definitely could, doctors um, go through training again um, to relearn all the intricacies, but it takes a lot of time um, and it's very costly. So if you make a lot of mistakes when you do it, then it, um, you know, it gets expensive for the practice as well. I mean, it's an expensive service for patients, but um, yeah, it's also can be expensive if you don't know what you're doing. So um, we're a big referral base for a lot of our specialties for a reason that all the doctors have dedicated extra time and learning how to do things like this or vision therapy and things like that. So for our keratoconus patients, um, we can do the whole scope in terms of sometimes they're seeing, being monitored um, by a corneal specialist and we can co-manage with them and just fit their scleral lenses. Or if their condition's pretty stable, we can monitor their keratoconus health for them. Um, this is a new form that we worked with the text to make and it's kind of like our dry eye form, but you'll start seeing it at both practices where it goes over all the special testing we do at every six months for keratoconus patients. So that includes everything from a topography, um, we'll do pack, the special OCT pachymetry. We also do what's called specular microscopy. And we're gonna talk about all these machines more in depth um, in another lecture. Um, but just so you kind of know, those are machines that we use to monitor keratoconus. Um, we also look at um, the patterns of the eyes and we obviously monitor their prescription and things like that. And so those are things we all check every six months and if we ever see changes or progression, then we start talking to the patient, um, just saying if there's any preventative strategies that we can um, work with coordinating for them to help slow down the condition. Um, but the biggest thing we like to tell patients is that, you know, there's a lot of new things in the works for them. And even though maybe in the past they haven't seen well or if they've um, had transplants, that we a lot of times have the ability to get them to see better with um, doing specialty lenses in the practice. I think that's it. Any questions? And keratoconus patients can still get cataract surgery, um, but we still tell those patients that they're going to still need glasses because, again, they still have keratoconus after they've had cataract surgery. Um, and so we kind of give them that. Because a lot of times they hear from their friends, oh, yeah, I got cataract surgery. I didn't need to wear glasses anymore. Well, they didn't have keratoconus. So um, it's a lot of setting the right expectations for these patients, but also giving them hope that um, usually we can get them to see better. And we, it is important, even though their condition stable, it is important to see them every year because if we detect any progression. So if you can imagine the cone, if it keeps um, getting more cone shaped, it can eventually, like with the scleral lens, start. You don't want it to ever rub against the lens because rubbing, again, instigates more thinning. And so that's why it's important that we see them for their eye health as well as to make sure their lenses are never rubbing on the cone part of their eye. And that's it. All right. What time is it? <laughs>